Let's get to the corporate story around the fintech space and the Swedish buy now, pay later firm Klarna pushing, really interestingly, into retail banking by rolling out digital accounts in the US and much of Europe. It's happening, of course, as the firm prepares for an IPO, potentially in the US. Klarna's CEO and co-founder Sebastian Siematkowski joins me now from Stockholm for the latest. Sebastian, thank you for taking the time. Talk to us about what this push then into retail banking says about your ambitions, Klarna's ambitions, to push further into this space, what it could mean as well for the top line in terms of revenues. I think, you know, the banking industry is so interesting. This is one of the probably least competitive, right? The high barriers of entry, low, you know, you have to be a big volume cost company to, to be able to operate and there's a lot of regulations and stuff. So, uh, but ever since 15, we said that the future of financial services will be a digital AI powered financial assistant that really works on behalf of the customer, analyzes your spending and say, hey, you're overpaying on the mortgage. Let me re- renegotiate that for you. Let me fix, you know, let me make sure to save you time and money. And ever since that, that's been the direction of the company. And and I, I think now this for us is one of those huge steps when we're now starting to offer deposits accounts or, or positive balances accounts across both Europe and the US, which is also unheard of, right? Because mm-hmm. banks usually would go like one market at a time and we're launching it in over 10 markets at the same point of time. So it's super exciting for us and it's very important as Klarna is both about credit payments and debit payments where you pay the full amount immediately, which is already 30% of our $100 billion annual volume. Yeah, so look, it is ambitious, as you say, and you're taking on the likes of JP Morgan, you're taking the likes on, of, of City and, and others. Do you have a sense, Sebastian, of how much, how much market share you could carve out? Well, I am overly, I'm very, very convinced that's what's going to happen with technology here. We're going to see a disruption in the uh, in the retail banking industry. And that out of that will emerge probably three, four large global retail bank players, which, you know, very likely to me could be Klarna, could be Revolut, could be Nubank, could be a few of those who have already proven now that, you know, we have 80 million users worldwide, right? Like acquiring 80 million users and then starting offering them more and more rich banking services is, is pretty Pretty unheard of. There are few banks of that size, but we're obviously not yet serving them with a full offering yet. But as we do that, we think it's it's going to outcompete because the the, the incumbents are simply poorer from a technology perspective and also much much more costs. Right? Uh, I mean, if you compare the cost at which we deliver these services to the big banks, there's a huge difference. So I think that this is just the beginning. And just like we've been talking about self-driving cars for many years, and now I actually went on a Waymo in San Francisco, it actually worked. I think this will eventually happen. It's just a matter of time. Okay, and, and in terms of in terms of projections around top line numbers, revenue streams, do you, do you have some estimates? Do you have some kind of ballpark figures that you're looking at as you project out in terms of the potential value of this push? Uh, yeah, I mean, for us, one of the biggest things with this, Rice, is that we, we our volumes are over a hundred billion dollars per year. But so far, uh, mm-hmm. those money has instantly been pushed back to the bank of the customers, to the other networks uh, like Visa, and Mastercard, and with us having positive balances, this means that more of the money will stay within our network. Uh, more of those positive balances will build up in our network, and that's obviously going to have a dramatic impact on both our payments costs as well as our cost of funding. We have already offered very attractive deposits uh, historically, but what's really cool about this uh, positive balance account in Europe is we're going to offer up to three and a half percent interest on that uh, balance account, which I think yeah. most European consumers have not been spoiled with that kind of uh, posit- uh, interest on their on their debit accounts. Okay, so you've got that interest offering in Europe. You've got the banking license in Europe, of course. You don't have a banking license in the US yet. Are you making progress on that front? I know this is an ambition of yours. What is the time frame? Do you need to get that banking license before the IPO? Uh, no, I don't think that's a prerequisite. Um, I think, I mean, to some degree, our U.S. success almost took a little bit by surprise, right? Like, I mean, uh, in 2019, our U.S. business was non-existent. Today, it's the largest uh, part of our business, both in revenue and number of customers. It's over 30 million. We're probably going to hit over a billion dollars in revenue in the U.S. pretty soon. So, um, but and that has obviously m- uh, made sure that we are doubling down our efforts to accelerate rolling out new services in the U.S. as well. But ex- especially when you talk about things like bank licenses, it does take some time, right? Right, we we uh, they took us a few years to get our European bank license, so we don't want to make the you know the dependency on the IPO to that. Okay, what are you seeing in terms of consumer behaviour in the US? Are you seeing any softness at all, Sebastian, or are they holding up in terms of that resilience? Are you seeing a change in consumer habits? 
Yeah, I'm a, I'm a little bit confused about the reports around that because from my perspective, when we analyzed our numbers and, you know, again, considering that we have over over half of the top 100 U.S. retailers um, that we work with, we, we do have quite attract, you know, interesting numbers to follow these things. But my impression was that, that's, you know, Christmas was actually would have been a little bit softer than we saw about nine months ago but thanks to a lot of discounting the volumes were pushed up and that didn't really materialize and now as i'm hearing some of these retailers report softening numbers we actually see the opposite i've seen quite a quite a good and strong solid uh uh sales in the u.s so so not not really what, what something mm. we have been able to so okay on the ipo sebastian how much enthusiasm have you seen for that ipo so far well, uh, we're very uh, flattered by media attention to it, at least, <laughs> since it seems to uh, to be written about uh, quite a lot. But I think that, like, I, I guess I mean from investors, investors. <laughs> from investors. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, like, um, you know, from investors. I mean, obviously, we had, you know, w- one or two weeks ago, uh, a pretty, you know, dramatic event in the stock market, right? So that, you know, you can kind of see. I think before that, there was like more of an acceptance. We're going to go into a period of time where, you know, IPOs are going to start happening again. There's going to be more interest in these. But I mean, in our opinion. I think that what people really appreciate mostly about Klarna is that two years ago, this business was, you know, um, very much attractive, growing fast in the U.S., but also loss making. And in just two years, we have increased revenue by 50 percent. We have increased gross profit by 100 percent and we reduced cost in 30 percent, which means that now we are, you know, uh, profitable. And I think those kind of financial performance obviously do raise the eyebrows a little bit with with um, okay. uh, investors. <laughs> also, as we have due to AI committed to continue shrinking the company, we've already gone from 4,500 to 3,500 in the last year, and we are committed to continuing on that path, uh, not by layoffs, but simply yeah. by natural attrition rates. You, you've been an early mover on Gen AI. You reached out to Sam Altman of, of, of uh, ChatGPT, OpenAI, pretty, pretty early on in all of this. What's been one of the most surprising things that stood out to you as you've embedded some of this Gen AI across the business? Yeah, I think that the, it, it is, to me, in a way, I would actually partially say that, like, I was even, you know, kind of, pulled into the hype uh, a year ago where a little bit like we you know again self-driving cars you know we used to re- read about them in the press every day and then you would look out the window and like where are they where are they it's not happening and now it's actually happening and i think that like to some degree i was almost like drawn into the hype a year ago as well it's like okay in the year you know the whole thing will already have like totally dramatically changed everything and now you almost have the opposite you hear people like oh we tried it didn't give us the results and so forth but in telling yeah. me what i'm seeing at Plana is that it is working it's just it will take a little bit further time before it will have the full implications to us we've already had okay. delivered some fantastic results but we're super excited what's coming in the next 12 months before we let you go sebastian look what do we win you back you're going to list in the us that's the suggestion that's the expectation what does europe and the uk need to do is there anything they could do to win this listing <laughs> well one thing that i have said uh, to regulators in the Euro, because there's been so much discussion in brussels as well how do we create a competitive uh, market and i i have suggested and i actually got some positive uh, from some of the foreign ministers that i was invited by all the uh, finance ministers of eu um is that i think that if if europe europe will never you know will never agree on like where should listing should the big stock market be is it paris is it frankfurt is it you know uh whatever european countries so the only way to actually get this to work is if if you would mandate all all the stock exchanges in Europe so that any stock that gets listed in one is automatically traded in another, I think that could reach the critical mass to create an investor base that is, you know, similar size to the one we see in the US, because that's really one of the biggest challenges when you make those comparisons. If a company like ours is okay. already mostly US business from revenue size, it will have to be a, you know, a similar size of investment base and, and stock market size to, to make it a, a relevant listing point. Okay, look, Sebastian, really appreciate your time, as ever. Really important updates coming through from the business. Klarna CEO and co-founder, Sebastian Tsimatkowski, on the latest. Thank you, Sebastian, as that company, of course, prepares for that IPO, likely the summer of next year, is what we understand.